to kind of get things um, started, I wanted to um, read you a poem. And this uh, poem gives you, uh, is, is kind of a special one for this conference because it is part of what we extracted the name of our conference from. Um, how many people are familiar with Mary Oliver? <laughs> Mary Oliver, wherever you are, Thank you, honorary nature journaler, <laughs> right? Um, and this is a poem that she wrote called The Summer Day. She wrote, who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she flicks her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down into the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? <laughs> That's where we got the wild from Wild Wonder. What is it you plan to do with your wild, one wild and precious life? What is she doing? She's looking at a grasshopper, deeply at this grasshopper, right? That's powerful. Um, so if you hadn't heard that, um, I thought everybody in this room needed to hear A Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Um, you also need to hear our speaker tonight. Um, so Claire Walker Leslie, I, I, I'm actually going to go off script tonight um, because uh, I just need to find out how many books it was that she's written. Um, oh, 13 right? Best-selling, just awesome books on how to do nature journaling. Um, this, um, our speaker tonight is really personally important to me. Um, when I was a little guy, I was struggling in school. I'm dyslexic. And the, the things that they want you to do in elementary school, my brain wouldn't jump through those hoops. Um, I couldn't spell the words. I couldn't do the multiplication tables. I couldn't do all the things that, um, for a kid at that age, you think are kind of the signs of intelligence and capacity and worth. Um, it was a really difficult time. I had just about given up on myself. And um, for me, my solace was, and the way I could kind of find some peace, is that I would, after school, um, I had a little journal in my backpack, and I would divert from the path home, and I would wander through Golden Gate Park and chase um, you know, rufous-sided towhees and other sorts of birds that I would find in the forest. I'd find these treasures, and I'd be sketching what I saw. And... Um, I found that you know, I could learn, I could, I, could, I could tell my friends by their sounds. And that, that book, that, that process, my, my breathing, my heart rate, everything changed. I felt like I kind of, I, I, I belonged there in the woods with that book in my hands and those birds beside me. Um, but I was still alone. And...
my dad one day came home with this book, thick book, this big, um, actually the same size of the book that I wrote. Maybe you might guess how I got the idea for that. <laughs> um, um, nature Drawing, A Tool for Learning. And I looked through this book and I had found my Yoda. And it spoke to me. I, I, I got it. Now, a dyslexic, it was really tough to read. Reading is still a very difficult process. In those days, it was agonizing. But at night, after everybody else had gone to sleep, I would click on my light and I would pour through this book. And it informed so much of my outlook, my philosophy, and um, I, I, I just, I hung on every word. Um, I felt like I wasn't alone. And this, this, this woman on the, the East Coast, um, there's a few pictures of her in there. Like, that was, th she was my buddy. So that was Claire Walker Leslie. And that was, that book was critical in my personal development of my philosophy towards nature journaling. Um, and also it was, was, was critical in rescuing me from a downward spiral. Sometimes the right book at the right time, and that was the one for me, and it had pictures in it. <laughs> um, so then some years later, um, I, was, I was working, I was in college. I was working as a naturalist at the Teton Science School in Grand Teton National Park. And this school has a, um, the, the, the school will have adult seminars where they will bring people in. I was teaching all these young kids, um, but my program was only a day program, and in the afternoons it would stop. I would drop all the kids off in Jackson Hole, and I would come back to the, the, the campus. Well, one of the classes that they had was this class on nature journaling, taught by Claire Walker Leslie and Hannah Henchman. I was starstruck. I was utterly starstruck, and I just, you know, I had my little journal, <laughs> and 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 I came in and I said, could could um, after um, my my class is over, you know, could I could I just sort of you know, uh, I could, could I sit in on some of the classes? They were so loving and so welcoming, and. Both of them, after their sort of teaching time was done, both of them spent independent time with me, kind of looking through my journals, giving me feedback, asking me questions. I felt like they had welcomed me into their tribe. And um, so those contacts are, are, that forms the core of my current philosophy. So like all those, Ideas that you're kind of getting from that book, uh, like The Law's Guide, guess who <laughs> it comes from, right? Um, so I, I really want to, to, to send an, 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 an honest shout out to, to, to my mentors um, and the people who lit the way for me. Um, there's, um, together they've got a long, long history of, of, of doing this and this is what you're seeing here is a movement that you started. And so um, we are honored to, 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 to have you here. Um, we are, are honored to have the opportunity to, to learn from you. Um, we are grateful for what you started. Um, and we are really excited to continue that and bring it forward into the future. So thank you for those gifts. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Claire Walker Leslie. So um, thank you all for having me here. I really, um, I wanna make this fun 
and I want to talk quickly. I've had the great pleasure of meeting a lot of you already. You've seen my journals, so I'm, I'm not going to say, and look at this, because you can't see it anyway. Um, but what I do ask you to do in my workshops is to look at my journals. They are different. Everybody's journals are different. And that is the blessed thing that, that Jack and I have had so much fun teaching together because we come together not over necessarily the format, but the intention. And I've been doing this for 50 years. I have been to many, 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 many places. And in fact, Jack, I have to just momentarily say I went over to see a, a colleague of mine in Scotland, because I am European trained, who stood in front of his group of, uh, what were they, students, and held up the nature drawing book and said exactly the same thing you said, Scotland. So um, that book has been all over the world. I get emails from every place. But I have to give you a lot of humility. And I do want to tell you my story. Um, because it's kind of backwards. I had no intention of doing this, nada. Um, but I want to do some drawing with you tonight. And uh, I'm used to drawing in the dark. Sorry, if you're not, you're going to have to draw in the dark. Uh, do you all have paper with you? OK. Um, but I first, and I'm not going to wear it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but not those. Um, I'm being videoed, and I, excuse me for making funny faces, videographers, thank you for doing this. Um, I do do, on top of this teaching, I do a lot of reading for inspiration. I do get down underneath, as my sister would say, the kitchen sink a lot. And Mary Oliver has been seminal. I've heard her read quite a few times. She is magnificent. Sadly, we've lost her. But I have um, several quotes. There are many, many good quotes out there. And my books are full of them. Um, this is Rumi. Let the beauty we love become the good we do. I uh, pick up quotes from very vicarious places. I'm sure you do as well uh, from our local newspaper. I still get, and I'm just going to give a, a, a shout out for it, um, Time Magazine. Time Magazine often has some very interesting articles on the environment and sociopolitical articles and art, art articles. And this is, I think, a fabulous quote by Ava DuVernay, who was the uh, director of the uh, film Selma, and also um, A Wrinkle in Time. When we pivot from the perils of politics and power to the blade of grass, the note of music, the line of a novel, the expression on the screen, we breathe deeply and are revived. This is why I boarded a plane at 7 o'clock Monday morning and flew out here, because I hope through these days that has been wonderfully organized, you go leaving revived. We all need to find ways of revival. And uh, this is why I did my 13th book called A Year in Nature, A Memoir of Solace, feeling that, Jenny, if you can hear me, uh, books do make a difference. And uh, my 13 books have apparently made a difference. Um, Nine of them, 10 of them are still in print. And I'm, I, you know, the side thing is, yes, I, I do make some money off of them. But thanks to Amazon, they're all over the world. What I want you to do right now uh, is just a little bit of your own personal soul searching is why write for yourself your own credo. Why are you here? And I'd like you to take two minutes of 
what it is that has Jack has caught you on that brings you here. It can be a haiku, it can be two sentences, it can be three sentences, it can be just off the cuff. Nobody's going to read this, just read it to yourself. Okay? On your mark, get set. I'm timing you. Okay, obviously this could take hours of writing, um, and you might want to continue it. Often when I'm doing residencies, I will ask urban, rural, suburban kids, why study nature? And they write back the most amazingly profound things. I would find that hard to answer. It's a very complex subject. But it needs to be answered. Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, so briefly, my story, you, I, I've asked several of you, what do you want me to talk about? You know, you all want to go to bed. I want to go to bed. I want to go out and look for birds. I'm a birder. Why am I here? Um, why did I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to take this plane that went forever? I, will, I want to tell you this, though. You've got to take this plane. You've got to take a plane from Massachusetts via Austin, Texas to San Jose because I sat by the window, and I usually am afraid to sit by the window. I sit on the aisle. I'm terrified of flying. But I wanted to see the landscape below. This is a huge country. How many of you have flown over Texas? <laughs> Whoa, it just goes on and on and on <laughs> and on. My daughter had the chutzpah to just drive 360 degrees around this country, over 9,460 miles, bless her. Uh, her boyfriend joined her with part of the time and my husband with part of the time. This, this is an amazing country when we have to honor it and we have to protect it. Um, so my story, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I grew up not thinking about nature. My, my parents, my mother had a garden, my father walked to work, but we didn't do nature stuff. But we grew up outdoors because that's what you did. Indoors was not very interesting. Uh, we didn't have all the gimmicks that kids have. I went into music. I played the cello. I studied three hours a day. I practiced. I studied at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. That was my passion. And so that is where my skills have come from. I went on to college in Minnesota. I never went outside. I mean, Minnesota, as you know, is a gorgeous state. I never went outside except with boyfriends into the woods. <laughs> I mean, that's what you did in the 60s. So my time was in the music building. This was a hard time. There was the Vietnam War, Martin Luther King, uh, Bobby Kennedy, JFK. It was, it was a, a, you think today's rough? The 60s were rough. But my life was music. So I graduated from Carleton College in Minnesota in 1968 in a degree with art history. I had no idea what I was going to do, which is true of a lot of us back then. So I went and taught art. And I spent a summer in a commune with artists where they were, we were up all night, slept all day, and everybody was depressed. <laughs> there, was, there was this thing, if you're an artist, you're depressed. That was the way it was in the 60s. I wore black. Uh, they thought I was Joan Baez, you know, because I, I, I played the cello. Um, so I never really connected at all with nature. Therefore, I can really understand in my talks when I confront and I'm with people who say, I don't, I don't really care a fig. I got to know a friend, and she denies all of this, but like Jack had me as a mentor, I had her. On weekends, instead of being indoors playing her cello or her viola da gamba, which I was also doing, she was out on the dunes bird watching. She had this amazing attitude towards life. And I went, huh, how come she's happy and I'm depressed? <laughs> so what I want to say to you is that that was my conversion. It was a very, very personal one. It had to do with attitude. It had to do with, I had a boyfriend who took me camping. I'd never been camping before. It was his mother 
who first told me about wildlife artists, Francis Lee Jacquees, uh, George Mercetton, uh, John James Audubon, Robert Bateman. And my boyfriend immediately, uh, eventually said, you love my mother more than you love me. <laughs> and I said, you're right. <laughs> uh, but with Dick, I helped to start an environmental school called Habitat that is still going as a mass Audubon sanctuary. And it was there in 1970, 1971, that I was teaching weaving as it related to nature, pottery as it related to nature, printmaking as it related to nature, and I was still depressed. I was still playing music. But I found in this connection with students there that drawing was the most direct way of studying nature. And I stopped all this other teaching and I started teaching nature drawing at our local um, adult education center. And it was at that adult education center that I had an editor from, this was 1978, an editor write me a letter. Nobody emailed then, wrote me a letter saying, we would like you to write a book on nature drawing. And I, I was married then and busy with, I was a printmaker at that point, put the letter aside, I thought, this, this is, you know, this is one of these quack crank things. And I literally remember it, uh, because we also have a house in Vermont. I, I got a little bit drunk one night, and I banged out this um, table of contents and sent it off to her. And she called me, and she said, we want you to write this book. And I said, are you crazy? I said, I, I don't know how to write a book. She said, you went to college, didn't you? <laughs> she said something that is crucial, and it's the editors I'm still working with today. She said, I will help you. So the Nature Drawing book I stand by today. It's an absolutely excellent book because, A, I do know how to write. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as an art historian, I really feel very strongly, and I was telling this to students this afternoon, if you want to learn how to draw water, rocks, sky, birds, go to the people who know how to do it. So that book has Leonardo da Vinci, well actually the art of field sketching has Leonardo da Vinci, it has Rembrandt, it has Degas, it has the masters, and the biggest suggestion I have for you is to go to the art museums and look at how people who know how to draw, draw. The other thing I do in my teaching is copy. This, is, this goes back to the ateliers of Raphael. Copy somebody's work that you like. That is how I learned. I had nobody in the States to study from. I decided that I wanted to stop printmaking, that I wanted to learn how to draw birds and animals and landscapes and rocks, and I, there was nobody. Roger Tar Peterson, I knew, and I asked him, and he said, I don't teach. Robert Bateman, I knew, uh, he said, I'm not ready to teach. So my husband and I were hitchhiking, hitchhiking, you could do that, hitchhiking in 1974 with backpacks around Great Britain where we met some of Europe's top wildlife artists. And they saw my sincerity and they said, you must meet Eric Enyan. And Eric Enyan was the mentor who I took his ideas of how to draw these animals. And so it is Eric's words that are in the nature drawing book. I have had the incredibly wonderful fortune of studying in Europe with Eric Enyan in England in 1976, um, and then John Busby, who became almost a foster father from 1982, really until he died in 2015, um, Gunnar Brusevitz in Sweden, and Lars Johnson in Sweden. So I, I, I come to you with a lot of humility because basically what I'm doing is passing on to you this information that I've had and gathered for years studying in Europe with other field artists, because the artists over there work with binoculars and are out on the sea cliffs. Um, but I also want to say to you with great humility, I'm a mother, 
I'm a wife. I'm a grandmother. We have many people coming to our house in Vermont. I spend a lot of time, like all of you, cleaning the kitchen sink. <laughs> so I don't have a fancy atelier. I don't really even have a studio. My studio is outside, and as some of you know, my studio is Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, because of the success of the nature drawing book, um, and I've been doing uh, field naturalist pages for the back of Mass Audubon's magazine, Houghton Mifflin asked me to publish notes from a naturalist sketchbook. That was done. And so I, I, I sort of liked doing books. It was fun because I could be at home raising kids. I had you know, various kids propped up beside me. Um, and they participated and helped. So for a while, yes, I was doing a book a year. And I'm not going to go through all of them, because you've been seeing them. But basically, it was the nature drawing book, then uh, notes from a natural sketchbook, then I illustrated a book for somebody on the sea's edge, then I did a naturalist sketchbook, and then I did nature all year long. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, then I did keeping a nature journal, then the nature connection, and then I did this book that some of you have seen that is actually one of my favorite books called The Ancient Celtic Festivals and how we celebrate them today. Uh, then I did, did I say The Nature Connection? Then I did um, The Curious Nature Guide. And I thought I was done. Every time I do a book, I say, I'm done. And then I say, no, I'm not quite done. Um, because as I said, I feel books really can make a difference. I've had the most beautiful, beautiful emails from people saying, your books, as you've been saying to me, your books have really helped me. Um, some people put them beside their bed. Some people, you know, the story, the favorite story I was telling you was somebody emailed me and said, I'm very sorry your book got all wet because I dropped it in the bathtub. Um, these, I want these books to be companions. That is, that's what books should be. So I'll just bring you up to date, and then um, I want you to do this drawing. I was done, and then um, I can't remember which came first. My husband has been diagnosed with a, a very um, unfortunate blood illness. And so we've spent a lot of time in and out of ERs, and really, life has become up up front, short. And I had used uh, going to nature a lot more for what we were talking about and Jack was talking about, of just the being there. I'm part of a meditation center, and it's that nature as solace. But it's not just for me. It's the understanding of what is out there. Uh, you will see in my journals that more and more I am a storyteller. I, I'm not making pretty pictures. I am with nature completely. I don't care what my journal pages look like because they are my seeing um, of, of whether it can be crows out the window. Um, I was walking past the lawn the other day, and I saw these black humps. I was with my granddaughter. I saw these black humps, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting, objet d'art. It was 10 turkeys looking like objets. Um, so that went into my journal. Um, and I get this, really, the nature story concept from Gunnar Brusevitz. So I am taking pieces and bits, which is what you should do, taking bits and pieces from other people. But be careful that you don't become just bits and pieces, that it becomes yours uniquely. Um, so with my husband's illness, and the political spiraling that's going on and the daily really increased concern about Mother Earth. Uh, I came home from yet another march in Boston and I said, I need to do something. And so that is this new book. It um, starts with the winter solstice. It's very much geared towards uh, light because everything is affected by light. And on the winter solstice, on our winter solstice, the sunsets are already getting longer. So it's 12 pages from my journal each month 
with color panels, which you've seen in some of my uh, books. It's a meditation that I do of what is January, what is February, through color. Um, and I do a lot of this color stuff with little kids because they can't draw. So what is the color of October? What's the color of the day? And so it is 12 months really myself dealing with this terror of my husband's illness, the terror of this current government, the terror of the future of my own grandchildren, and the resolve that in looking carefully at a screech owl, I've forgotten that for the moment. So that book is um, supposed to be coming out in November. Um, and look for it. So I think that is probably um, enough for me. I want to make this a brief night for you. Um, other than what I love saying to teenagers, if I had been asked when I graduated from college whether I'd be an internationally known wildlife artist, I would have gone, a what? Um, you never know, do you? You never, yeah, 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 never know. Um, so, do we have enough light here um, for you to, I want you to, I don't, usually when I do blind contours, you know, we all have sticks and leaves and shells and stuff. But I was thinking today, I want to do something interactive with you, because I would be sitting in the back there falling asleep. I want you to do a drawing of your hand. So get your hand. And actually, you know where this was an inspiration? Albrecht Dürer has the most beautiful series of drawings of hands. If you want to learn how to draw, draw your hand. Um, so everybody, do you have a pencil? Do you all have pencils? Do you all have a piece of paper? I can sort of see people in the front row do. Um, gee, I should be wearing a visored hat. Now I can see you. <laughs> um, OK, so the deal with the blind contour, many of you have done blind contours, but many of you haven't. This is the deal. I want you to, and usually I demonstrate, I mean, this, this is a pretty sort of unusual situation, but that's okay. So I want you to look at your hand and figure out a position that you can get your hand into. Uh, FYI, this is a fantastic way to learn foreshortening. So get, get an, in, it, you know, don't do, you can do this if you want, but get it, what we say, out of the parallel, out of the flat. And do not look at your paper. Absolutely, what I say to kids is if you look at your paper, your eyes are going to burn up and fall out of your head. So that's, that's, a, little, that's a little scary. Extreme. Um, position your pencil on the paper, and we call these bug drawings. You are going to draw around without looking at the paper, your hand, not just the outline, but the fingers as they flip over, your fingernails, the, excuse me, the wrinkles in your hand, if you have rings, and don't stop until I tell you to. So are you all ready? Any questions? Any, any questions? Um, on your mark, get set, go. You have one and a half minutes. I'm timing you. OK. You can look. <laughs> Yay, I want to hear the laughing. <gasps> this is nutsy cuckoo. It's supposed to be nutsy cuckoo. Wait, who, who of you, now I can see you, who of you have done blind contours before? Yeah, don't, don't you think they're wonderful? Yeah. Don't you think you should do them all the time? Uh, I forget about doing them until I teach them, and then I go, duh. Um, so you know all the reasons why they're wonderful. And I have done blind contours with second graders all the way up to 90-year-olds. 
Uh, they're freeing, they're liberating. I have many people who are completely paralyzed at drawing. This is the entry point, the blind contour. Because as you know, because you've done them before, all of your contours look like everybody else. So if you have a class of people who are competing, uh -uh, uh, they all look the same. So um, in th these exercises are in all of my books. Um, I, I, I should say, yeah, I, I did, I'm not trained as in art school. I took art, but I did not like it because it was all bottles and cubes and you know the figure drawing. But I've drawn since I was six years old because my sister drew. And so we, we drew for entertainment. Um, in 1957, when we drove across the country as a family, I kept a journal. Um, so drawing is part of my language. I'm, my family knows I'm always drawing. That is how you get better. This is not an avocation for me. This is my job. Um, and, and that makes it hard for me to teach because I'm good at it. Uh, it's like Yo-Yo Ma was asked, Mr. Ma, how come you're so good? He said, practice, practice. So um, Jack and Beth know this is very hard for me to teach you because I would love to have you for weeks. And that's when I will see the improvement. So be, be kind to yourselves. Be gentle and go back to these blind contours. OK, the next one that I put into all my books, and, and I love telling kids that adults cheat. They, they just do. They have to look. So this one, you can cheat. But still, it's a continuous line drawing. I call this modified drawing. And in fact, when I'm drawing birds, this is the one I use. Um, so all of these can be used in your daily life. They're not just art exercises. So do your hand again in a different position. And this time, don't pick your pencil up. That, that's a very crucial thing. Don't pick your pencil up, but you can just peek to see where you are, but continue. And I'm going to, again, give you two minutes. So, People don't think you're crazy. The first drawing right, blind contour, two minutes. And this next one will be modified contour, two minutes. Or, um, well, you know, I, I have control. I'm going to decide, you know, how long I think. One and a half minutes. OK, so you ready? On your mark. Get set. Go. Peek, but do not judge. FYI, probably the most beautiful part of this is I do these exercises in hundreds and hundreds of classrooms and nature centers and colleges. It's the silence in the drawing that is the golden part of this. The kids who are probably the most hungry for silence are the teenagers, and they don't know it. So they get two minutes of silence. OK, 20 seconds. Ten. Five, four, three, two, one. OK, peak. Do you know the guy, uh, Zen Sing Zen Drawing, Frederick Frank? Go get his book. Um, he was very, very helpful for me. When I was at a very low point with the uh, nature drawing book, I went down to his Pachaman Terrace. Do you, do you know Frederick Frank? Any of you? Um, he he uses, uses drawing as really a Zen meditation. Um, and so I had him come up to our place, and he did a weekend residency, all blind and modified contours the entire weekend. Unbelievably wonderful. Um, very powerful. So 
just quickly, look at your two drawings. Which are you preferring, the blind or the modified? And again, you know, it's why, why I, I'm left-handed. Jack is dyslexic, I'm left-handed. I can't add, um, and lots of stuff that left-handed people can't do. Everybody does things differently. And so my way of teaching is to bring in all of these exercises. Try this, try that. So here's one more exercise. And uh, ooh, we have two more minutes, Beth. Um, <laughs> this one, um, all of these I use in drawing birds. Um, plants, you know, you can sit at the, with the plant for hours and it doesn't move except it wilts. Um, so it does move. But with birds, and, and I would say, if, if you were going to ask me what, what's my top dog thing I'm, I love drawing the most, it's birds. I go birding regularly with a really wonderful friend of mine. We've been birding for years. We just, we call it gone for the day. I highly recommend it. You just disappear. Uh, a lot of students ask me, how do I put this into my life? I say, you put it on your calendar. Chris and I have this date. I'm wickedly busy when I get home. So is he. It's on the calendar. We're gone. Um, it's actually the day of the, the big climate strike. So we're striking drawing birds. Get a time in your calendar when you do this and you're not folding laundry. So um, I sit in the car and I draw the birds, or I'm out by the telescope, and the birds don't sit still. So this next drawing, you can look at your hand, you can look at the paper, you can do whatever you want, you can lift your pencil, but I'm giving you three seconds to draw your entire hand. OK? That's what you have with birds, even maybe not three seconds. So fresh piece of paper. Make sure you've listed it as blind contour, modified contour, and now this is called gesture sketch. Where did I get these? Chemo Nicolaides, the natural way to draw. If you want a good book on drawing, also any art school does this with the figures. I didn't make this up. I made up the modified contour. Gesture sketch, the model's always moving. OK, you ready? Your hand, I'm going to count. On your mark, get set. Three seconds. Stop. Oh. <laughs> You're not fast enough. A lot of students say to me, but I can't draw fast. Well, you learn. I, I've showed you the uh, drawings that I did. Uh, we just got back from Scotland. And I was sat in the back seat, and I drew. Learn to draw in the back seat of a car. It's really great because you are just staring out images, houses, birds, landscapes, and you draw what you see. I also, I have, to, I have to tell you something. One of the reasons I do books, I get a lot better at drawing at the end of the book than in the beginning of the book. I, I, I do books to draw. So get projects where you have to learn how to draw. Jack, isn't that true? We're, uh, you have projects so you draw? Absolutely. This, that, I, I, that's absolutely true. I woke him up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're, we're finishing shortly. Um, so I was <laughs> I know, Jack. We, we kid each other. Meet me and Jack. You know, it's really wonderful because Jack, Jack does this, and Jill does this. And we both tumble down the hill together, right? <laughs> um, no. I, I've had such great pleasure teaching with Jack because our philosophies are really similar, wouldn't you say? Uh, uh, well, I, my philosophy was born of you. Ups. I'm, I'm your student, and uh, absolutely. So, uh, well, what, what you say, ditto. Ditto, ditto. Um, I, I have to repeat to you that I happen to be at the right moment, at the right time, to live in Europe with these amazing teachers. So I have on my shoulders these, these great Eric Enyan, John Busby, 
Gunnar Brusevitz, Lars Johnson, I had these great people on my shoulders. That's what I'm trying to impart to you. Um, and if my books can help you, God bless. Um, we, uh, uh, and my journals, I can't not do them. They're equivalent to cutting off an arm. If I cut off an arm, I, I, it's, if I lost a journal, it would be like that. But uh, my journals are part of my breathing. My breathing in and my breathing out is, is the journal. Um, but I have that pleasure in that I have my journal with me all the time. And I, I don't want to say this is what you should do, but it's really part of my um, mental health, given the, the, the responsibility I have in my own personal life. Uh, and Mount Auburn Cemetery, the people there know I am there because it is a healing place. And I think for a lot of you, don't, wouldn't you say the reason that you're doing what you're doing is for your healing or your health or your sacredness or your, I don't know, maybe that's what you wrote in the beginning, maybe, maybe, maybe you didn't. Um, but enough. Uh, yeah, that's, that's enough. Unless, I mean, are there any questions? I can't see you, but. Hey, Beth, do we have minutes for questions or are we folding up and going home? You can, you can take a couple minutes of questions if people want. Okay, yell, because I can't see you. I have a question. Yeah. Do you ever, do you, if you wished you could start over, would you ever change that you would have started drawing earlier, like getting into wildlife drawing earlier? That's a great question. If I had to do it over again, would I have started earlier? Um, no. Because I had those years of drawing, only I was a cellist. As Yo-Yo Ma said, to, I've told you some of, the, some of you this wonderful story of Yo-Yo Ma. Do you know who Yo-Yo Ma is? Yes. Well, I met him over um, the meat counter in one of our local markets, and I, I'd just been teaching at Williams. Amy, where have you, where's Amy? She's probably not here. Amy. Anyway, I, I taught her in, in uh, a Williams class in 96. Um, I was coming back from Williams. I was exhausted. I was listening to the Bach Unaccompanied Suites. I, I went in to get the family dinner, and there was Yo-Yo Ma at the meat counter. And I went back to the car, and I went, no, 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 you're going to go back. And I went back, and I went, Mr. Ma, you're, <laughs> you're, you're wonderful. And he, he, being the great man that he is, said, well, now tell me, who are you? And I said, well, I used to play the cello. And he said, well, why used to? And I said, well, now I am drawing nature, and I am teaching across the country doing this, and I've written books, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and we had this wonderful conversation. And he eventually said, you know, you and I are doing the same thing, spreading joy across the country. And that was one of the greatest statements I've had. So I had years of, of preparing to draw with the same techniques of, of playing the cello. I am teaching you basically cello techniques. Um, so it's, it's, it's the practice. It's the practice. It's the practice. Um, but that's a good question. I don't. Maybe, maybe I would have been happier growing up in Nebraska. I, I, you know, it was my parents' fault. You know, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Um, so, other, other questions? Yeah. What is your favorite uh, natural subject to draw? Birds. That was an easy one. <laughs> Birds, because they're just all over the place, and they're so interesting, and they're doing stuff, and they're hard. They're really hard to draw. Any particular species that you like? Uh, shorebirds, shorebirds? Yeah. because they are the hardest. And because I'm a water person. Here we are. We live in Vermont, and I, I just crave water. So we saw a marble godwit today. Wow, that was the high point of the day. No, no, you were the high point of the day. <laughs> yes, Jack.
Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. We, we all have the inner critics. We all do. I, I, I would say I don't have it with myself when I'm with myself, but I could never put out, or if I do, and I have, put out my journals with all of yours. I would be comparing all the time. Um, it's, it's the inner critic that I have when I see other people's work. So, and, and you've really been addressing this, Jack, and I really think it's a good one, is it's so easy for us to compare ourselves with other people. And, and we are, are, I mean, I've seen the whole range while I've been here. And as, as an educator, I think it's very important for me and Jack to find good things in everything that you are doing. I was completely debilitated by a math teacher in sixth grade who said, who the hell taught you math? You are lousy. And you know what that does? That makes you not do four and four very well anymore. So I am extremely conscious of how the, the exterior critic can be and the interior critic. Um, I happen to really, really, really love my work, but I don't always think other people do. So, so that's probably the thing. Um, but, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years, so, and I've gotten a lot of appreciation. But I'd say to all of you, one of the very hard things for me is my publishers happen to love my loose field work. So when I do these very finished, polished drawings, they go, oh, yeah, that looks like everybody else's. Um, but, so I have to keep on apologizing to all of you. I really can draw very well. <laughs> but the journal is not the place for that. The journal is not, for me, I should say, for me, the journal is not a make pretty place. The journal for me is I am really absent of ego when I am journaling. I, I am, my, my, perso my persona is gone when I am looking at that kestrel or that salamander. Um, the drawing does not matter. That's just where I am at. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, whoa, whoa. I once kept a track because I thought it was sort of cool. Um, huh. Well, 31 um, plus Canada, uh, Scotland. Um, oh. Oh, yeah, this country. Um, where, where was my most funnest? We were talking about, there's somebody here, raise your hand. I, I had this really cool experience in Galena, Alaska with these Athabascan kids. Um, that, that was wild and crazy. They'd had a huge uh, flood on the Yukon River and so the whole village had been destroyed. And so they used up all their money re repairing the village. But the fish and wildlife, um, position there, decided it was really important for the town for me to come anyway. So I came and we ate moose the whole week. Um, and, and they were just wonderful. So I, you know, my husband keeps on saying, why do you keep doing this? Stay home and cook me dinner. <laughs> and I go, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love it. You know, you guys, you're like, you're like eating popcorn to me, right, Jack? We're addicts. We're, we're nuts. Um, yeah, all, all of you. Again, I'm just so uh, grateful uh, that you, you came tonight. It is really um, uh, also just so fun for me to, to reconnect with you. Um, and uh, I am I'm, I'm deep, deeply grateful for what you have done for all of us and this movement. It is, it, it is, it is a, a gift that is so much larger than any of us. Um, thank you. It's hard yeah. for me to take that, but. <laughs>